11th April 2021 Sharpen the X by Pastor Simon James Greetings in the name of Jesus and welcome to Riverside Tabernacle. I'm Pastor Simon and it's my honor to share God's word with you. I trust you will find this message inspiring and uplifting. May you be receptive to the voice of the blessed Holy Spirit. I just want to give you a bit of introduction to Riverside Tabernacle. Riverside Tabernacle is an online Christian ministry committed to preaching the truth about Jesus Christ and his redemptive work without fear or favor. The ministry offers Christian prayer and biblical counseling services. Riverside Tabernacle does not own the rights to the music used in this video. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we ask you for your blessing upon this thy word. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to help us to understand the word by enlightening it, enlightening our minds, illuminating our understanding, and helping us to grasp the hidden meaning in your word. We ask you, Lord, that you will bless every one of us, myself as I preach, my wife as she mans the camera, and all those who are listening in or watching today. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will bless them mightily. Let there be an anointing from the Holy Spirit amongst all of us today and help us to hear your words and listen to it carefully and to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we ask these mercies. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Our sermon today is called Sharpen the X. Sharpen the X. I want to talk to you as an introduction about the futility of a blunt axe. The futility of a blunt axe or a dull axe. Abraham Lincoln, the 16th President of the United States of America, said this, Give me six hours to chop down a tree, and I will spend the first four sharpening the axe. Give me six hours to sharpen, to chop down a tree, and I will spend the first four hours sharpening the X. This was a famous quote from him. Now the strongest lumberjack in the world will achieve little with a blunt X. If you look at the Japanese swordsmiths that make swords like the katana and the tanto, they take weeks to sharpen and polish the blade of these swords they make. Because sharpness is critical to success in battle. A sharp sword is critical to winning a battle. A samurai sword could cut a man in two with one stroke. It could cut a man totally in two. A Persian sword was so sharp that if you threw a piece of silk into the air and struck it with that sword, it would cut the soft silk in two. That is how sharp it was. Now to go into battle with a dull sword would be suicide. Now what was Lincoln talking about when he said, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four hours sharpening the axe? What he was saying that preparation, knowledge and mindset are critical to success. You need to be prepared with a thorough understanding of your subject and the task at hand or you stand the chance of failing in what you're doing. Any task worth doing is worth doing well. And preparedness is key to success. If there is one critical success factor for anything, it is preparedness. It includes planning. It includes logistics. It includes study and a lot of other things and understanding of the problem at hand and being prepared for any eventuality. Now this is also true of the believer who is called to witness for Jesus. We are all called to witness according to Matthew 28, 19, 20, that we are to evangelize. We are to go into all the world, preaching the gospel, letting people know about Jesus, introducing them to this savior who gave us salvation by himself dying, this God almighty, the God of the universe, the creator God, who came down, died for us and rose again and won this battle for us. Now, we are called to witness, we are called to evangelize. Now, our witness and our evangelism entails a battle with evil forces. 
Now, it sounds like some fairy tale or some Harry Potter novel when I talk to you about this. It is not. I'm not talking about just Wicca and stuff like that. I'm talking about spiritual wickedness in high places. I'm talking about satanic forces that exist in the air above us, that live in the, on the earth, in the water, that are there to prevent us from spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is our main objective on earth. Our main objective is to please God by living for Him and by telling others about this wonderful Savior. The Christian witness must study. A person who wants to witness for, for Jesus, he must study, she must study. They must improve their understanding of the Word of God. They must improve their lifestyle. They must cut away the dead wood from their lives, the things that are holding them down from doing what pleases God. And they must mentally and spiritually prepare before commencing the work of evangelism, before evangelizing, before speaking to somebody about the Lord. You need to understand the subject that you are speaking about. An unprepared witness is a weak witness. An unprepared witness is a weak witness. An unprepared evangelist is no evangelist. You cannot tell me about something if you do not know it thoroughly. The smart witness will plan, will train and prepare before the task. A sharp axe is a strength multiplier. What does that mean? A sharp axe is a strength multiplier. If you have a sharp axe, you don't need that much strength to chop down a tree. But if you have a blunt axe, it drains your strength. It's a demotivator. Now preparation of the body, the mind and the spirit is what characterizes the successful soul winner, the successful battle axe. Because the Lord says that the Christian, the believer is the Lord's battle axe. And as a battle axe to be effective, you need to be as sharp as possible. And we're going to go into that today and we're going to try and understand what the Holy Spirit is telling us. Now, if you look at Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse 20, it says there, Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. For thee will I break in pieces the nations and with thee I will destroy kingdoms. Let's go over that again. Thou, that's you, are my battle axe and you are my weapons of war. That's what the Lord is saying to you and, I, you and me today. For with you, I will break in pieces the nations. And with you, will I destroy kingdoms. What is the Lord talking about? The Lord is talking about using us as his battle axe to destroy the works of Satan in this world and to rescue those who need to be rescued and ransomed from from sin to salvation. So you are the battle axe. You are the axe in the hand of the Lord. I am a battle axe in the hand of the Lord. And we have to be sharp if we want to be effective. Spiritual sharpening. I want to talk to you a few minutes about spiritual sharpening. First Corinthians chapter two, verse four says, and my speech, this is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. In demonstration of the spirit and of power. A battle axe does not talk. A battle axe cuts. A battle axe cuts. A battle axe chops. Jesus after his resurrection, promised us a comforter. Who and not which. We do not refer to the Holy Spirit as an inanimate object. We refer to him as a person. So the Holy Spirit is not a which, it's a who. He's a who. Jesus promised us a comforter. Who is the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. You know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit does not only comfort us, He does more than that because He is God. He empowers us. 
He guides us. He gives us the power and the demonstration of His power. So when you go out and speak for the Lord, and you speak the words that God puts in your mind, in your heart, in your mouth, you are speaking in the power and the, demonstra the demonstration of the Holy Spirit and His power. The Holy Spirit is the voice of God that speaks to our spirits, guiding us. It is the voice that we hear sometimes who tells us, turn to the left or turn to the right. Stop, go, do this, don't do that. It is He who helps us to recall the words of God and the teachings of this Word of God. It is the Holy Spirit who teaches us this, who reminds us of this, who puts the words in our mouth and helps us to effectively defeat evil in our lives and to defeat evil in the lives of others. You're not just empowered over your own life, over demon for demonic forces and sickness in your own life. You are empowered over demonic forces that cause sickness and other problems in other people's lives as well. That is why Luke 9 is such an important chapter to me. And Luke 10 where it says, I give you power over evil spirits and all kinds of sickness. And all the works of the devil. God has given us. Why does he give us power firstly over the Holy Spirit? I mean over the demonic powers. Because he knows that is what causes all these other things that we suffer. This is what causes it. And Jesus came to rescue us from that. And he's using you as the battle axe in that fight against the devil. Without the Holy Spirit, you and I would be powerless. We'd be directionless and we would be useless. We would have no power. We would have no direction. And we'd be absolutely of no use to the Lord. We have to be obedient to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is who sharp that is he who sharpens us, makes us sharpen, sharper than we are, makes us keen, helps us to understand, helps us to rightly divide the word of God, help us to use the word of God to defeat Satan. Even Jesus, who is God, and when he was on earth, he was God, he was the God man. The Holy Spirit took him. The Bible says he drove him into the wilderness. Drove him into the wilderness. And he took, and he took him there. The Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. So he could prepare Jesus prior to his ministry. And while he was there, Jesus was fasting 40 days and 40 nights. And the Holy Spirit was watching him. The Holy Spirit was speaking to him. So when Satan came to him, remember Jesus wasn't acting in his power as God. He was acting in his power as man. He was God man. He didn't use his power and say Satan and defeat Satan immediately. He said he used the word of God. He received the words from the Holy Spirit and said, get thee behind me Satan. For it is written, for it is written, for it is written, thou shalt Obey the Lord thy God and you shall worship the Lord thy God and him only. That's what he told him. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Who empowered Jesus? The Holy Spirit. Now your preaching, your witness, your testimony is void. In fact, that means it doesn't have any, any uh, use. It has no effect if it is not backed by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one who sharpens us. He is the blacksmith who takes the axe, puts it on the vice and files it down until he takes all the rust and dullness out of you and we left with a spiritual shine and a sharp edge. He convicts us of sin and that is the oxidation, that is the rust, that is the dirt that accumulates in us and he convicts us and he removes it. Sometimes that is not easy because when a, when a, when a piece of metal is, a, is taken to the grindstone, the grindstone removes pieces of metal. It removes that layer of metal, the layer that has made it dull. To make the X from blunt to sharp, 
you have to lose something. And it is all the sin and the dross and the effects of your sin that the Lord Holy Spirit has to remove. He empowers us by sharpening us to make us effective witnesses for our Lord. And how does he do this? He does it by conviction. That's how he sharpens us, by conviction. He convicts us of our sin. And so the moment we know that we're sinning, he convicts us. We have to then commit to changing. We've got to commit to a change. And we've got to change and stay committed to not going back. We've got to repent from, of what we've done. That is how we become more effective and sharper as a battle axe for the Lord. Apart from the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. We cannot be an axe of the Lord or a battle axe of the Lord if we are not filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit. That is why when you receive Jesus, the Holy Spirit is deposited in your life. He's deposited in your life in some measure that God sees fit. The Spirit sharpens our abilities. He sharpens our talents. He sharpens our abilities to study the Word of God, to understand the Word of God. In fact, every time I read my Bible, the Lord speaks to me and opens my understanding. It feels as if I am understanding it, but in reality, it is God unveiling His Word into my intellect. And He sharpens our abilities to preach, to witness and defend the faith we have in Christ. He gives us, He presents us with the opportunities. He points out the opportunities. And when we open our mouth during the opportunity to witness, it is He who speaks through us. To be led by the Spirit is to obey God's will and to keep us from sin which displeases Him. Both the sins of omission and commission are avoided by keep walking in step with the Spirit of God. In other words, being yoked with the holy yoke of the Spirit of God. Now, what are sins of omission? Sins of omission are things that you know you should do, but you did not. And sins of commission are things that you know that you should not do, but you do anyway. The second part of sharpening is sharpening by the sword. Now, that sounds funny that the sword sharpens. When I'm talking about the sword, I'm talking about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now we are sharpened by the Word of God. Ezra, the book that you haven't read in a long time, 7.10 says, For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord, the Word of God, and to do it, and to teach God's statutes and rules in Israel. For Ezra, this is the man of God, the prophet, he had set his heart. He decided, firmly decided, that he was going to study this word of God, the law. And he was going to do it. Okay, that's the first part. And the second part, he was going to teach it as statutes and rules. Now, you and I, we've just spoken about the Holy Spirit sharpening us. And the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God because the Bible says distinctly that the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So the Holy Spirit's sword is the Word of God. Yes, the Bible. And He uses that. He first wants us to study and to learn and to apply in our lives and then to others. Don't try to teach me something if you're not applying it in your life. I won't be convicted of it. The entire life of the Christian, that's you and me, is based on the Word of God. And if you're not a Christian tonight, this morning, and you're listening, I want to tell you that you can also be part of this family. It's free. You don't have to pay anything. You call me, I'll pray with you. And I won't charge you even for the telephone call. The entire life of the Christian is based on the Word of God. Whatever we need to know is in this Word of God. The Bible is written. And it is a written revelation of God's word, which is Jesus Christ. This book is all about Jesus Christ. From the first word to the last word. It's all about the Lord. It's all about God. It's all about God's plan of redemption. Let me tell you, God is sitting so far up that 
He can see the whole world from the beginning to the end. Although they, I can't see a beginning and end, God sees it as one in one uh, glimpse. So God knows the end from the beginning. The Bible is a written revelation of God's word. Not, not that we worship the Bible. We don't worship the Bible. We worship God. But we reverence the words as God breathed. In other words, these words in this book were inspired by God. You can see my Bible is old. You know why it's old? See, pages are falling off and I've got to fix it up. I'm sure my wife would do that for me. But my Bible is marked. I use my Bible because this is the word of God and I love this. It's the love letter of Jesus Christ to us. So read it. And you'll learn about the love of God. Many people who never ever met the Lord, were never introduced to the Lord by people, met the Lord through reading His words. Okay, let's get back to the Bible. It is the word that sharpens us, that can sharpen us. By regular, diligent and systematic study, we can become sharp. Don't just open the Bible anytime and just read one or two verses. Do a systematic study. Start with the book of Mark. Read Mark. Mark is simple. Read it. Or read John. Read the Psalms, slowly get into the Word of God, but have a notepad, right? Make notes, learn. When you learn, when you write and study and write, you learn, you retain 90, 80, 90% 90 of what you learn. Now, we are not all apologists, defenders of faith, or teachers, but we are certainly all witnesses. Whether we're good, bad, a good witness or bad witness depends on how we apply the Word of God in our life, in our lives. If you are a witness, you rather be a good one. Otherwise, don't be a witness at all. You rather not go to court and speak lies or speak about something you do not know because you'll get caught out. So you'd rather be a good witness. Now, to tell a story, you need to know the story to tell. To tell a story, you need to know the story you want to tell. So if you want to speak about the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our commission, by the way, it's a command to us. It's not a nice to have. It's what God demands of us. Then we need to know the story. We need to know the word of God. The Bible, Bible is an almost first hand account of what God. It is a first hand account of what God wants us to know. Right. But it was. It was written. It was given to God's servants and they wrote it down for us. So we must not neglect to study God's word. Every word in the book is deliberate and important to God. Every word that's in that book is important and deliberate. Yes, we can go and talk about translations that the King James is original and, uh, and uh, the ESV is not good or the NIV is not good. Let's not debate that. I have my views, you have yours. But let me tell you that the Bible, most Bibles translations have enough of truth in it to point the way to God okay the word of God is a sword of the spirit as I said we believers need to know that we will face critics we will face unbelievers and we will face mockers people who despise us now how do we contend for the faith if we cannot defend our beliefs from the word of God Jude 1 3 says that we should contend for the faith. 1 Peter, Peter answers a question for us in 1 Peter 3 15. He says, Be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. You have a hope because you're a Christian. You know you're going to heaven. You know you have a hope in Jesus Christ. What are the reasons? How do you get this reason? How do you defend what you are doing? People are telling us now that this world happened with a big bang. There is no God. Hmm? There is no God. That's what they say. How do you defend that? How do you defend it? How do you defend it when they tell you that this is not the word of God? Or that Jesus Christ didn't die. Or if he died, he didn't rise. How do you defend that? You need to know the word of God. Now, the third way of sharpening your sword, or your sharpening your axe, or sharpening yourself as the battle axe of God, is... Iron sharpens iron. Proverbs 27, 17. I know you all knew we're going to come to this verse sooner or later. Iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. What does this mean? A tool cannot be sharpened on its own. Take the axe, hold it up in the air. It will never get sharp on its own. It needs another tool. 
like a grindstone or a file to sharpen it. It needs another tool as hard as itself or even harder as itself to sharpen it. Now this verse suggests not just one iron but two irons at least and it suggests a relationship. People need people. People need people and we need people for a variety of reasons. No man is an island somebody said. Man needs fellowship. He needs discipleship. He needs accountability or someone to be accountable to. He needs criticism and he needs direction. Okay, now some of you might dispute, but let's go through it. Fellowship, I said man needs fellowship. Fellowship implies mixing with each other, learning from each other, forging a relationship with each other, helping each other, and transferring knowledge from one person to another by word of testimony, by word of, by sharing experiences. And we need that. That is why we fellowship. Fellowship also brings us closer to each other. It builds understanding between people. And when people understand each other and are prepared to share, they can help each other. We all know the story of the old man who gave his son, his three sons, two sticks each. And he told them, okay, each one of you take your stick, take one stick and break it. And they broke it easily. Then they had one stick left. He said, bring your three sticks together. He tied them together. He said, now break these sticks. And they couldn't. And he said, there is strength in unity. Each of us has strengths and weaknesses. And these are complemented by somebody else's weaknesses and strengths. Our strengths complements or supplements somebody else's weakness. And our weaknesses are, sub, uh, our strengths are complemented by somebody else's strengths. You get that? It is a sense it's, or, or this sense of community that sets us apart as followers of Christ. Because Jesus said in his word, he said, you're a peculiar nation, a royal priesthood. I have set you apart. We are there to please God. We are not just individuals. We're a community of Christians. We're the church. We are believers. We're the nation of Christianity. We're not a religion, we're a nation. We need to get that in our heads, that we are together in this. And what I do affects you. And what you do affects me. A man who sins affects in a church. He can affect the whole church. You can get one person who comes and decides he's living right for Christ. And you can get the whole community changing for Jesus. Now, Jesus kept his disciples sharp. Now I want to talk to you about leadership to lead like Jesus. Jesus kept his disciples sharp with appropriate and timely teachings. For example, the fig tree. He showed them that they must always be ready to, uh, to, to produce fruit. And they must always produce fruit. Now, there were times when Jesus taught only his disciples, not, the, not everybody. There were many times when Jesus stood on a small knoll or a hill and he spoke to the people. He stood or sat in a boat and he preached to the people in these amphitheaters outdoors. But there were times when Jesus only preached only to his disciples. Only. These were the essential leadership coaching sessions that Jesus had. Discipleship is important. Every one of us should be a disciple. We should be discipled by our pastor, by a spiritual leader, by somebody who knows the word better than us. Now everyone must be accountable to some person. Notwithstanding that we are ultimately accountable to God, we should still be accountable to some other person. And I'll tell you why. That's why the Bible says, confess your faults to one another. Pray for each other. Accountability keeps one on the straight and narrow. Any organization, any man who thinks that he is an authority to himself, he is a law unto himself, will have a problem because he will fail. He will fail because he is not accountable to anybody. There's nobody to hold him accountable. And I'd rather be accountable to somebody on earth here than to ultimately in, in, end up in heaven and be accountable to God when it's too late to do something about it. Now let's talk about criticism, something that people don't like. 
criticism, but we talk about constructive criticism. Now, criticism is constructive if given and received in a spirit of love for the person that's receiving it, and it's received in a spirit of understanding and respect from the person who's giving it. Now, don't criticize me because you can. Criticize me to help me. Criticize me if you've learned from some mistake and you want to help me. Don't criticize me for the sake of criticizing me. That is very easy. I can rip anybody apart from the way they speak, to the way they sit, to the way they talk, to the way they handle the word of God, to their lighting, whatever, you can do that. You can criticize somebody for their lives, but you need to criticize people so that it builds people. That is why the Bible uses the word edify. We're a building. We're an edifice. We need to edify. We need to build each other up. We're building together and we're building each other up. The better the wounds, the Bible says in Proverbs 27, 6, better the wounds of a friend than the kisses of an enemy. I'd rather my brother or my sister tell me where I'm wrong and make me feel hurt and embarrassed, have egg on my face, rather than an enemy kiss me and betray me. You remember Jesus? The enemy kissed him. Again, the aim of communal fellowship must be preparation for service to God. Communal fellowship, communal accountability, communal discipleship, criticism and direction. We need to help each other. When you see me straying from the path, talk to me. Talk to me. If you have a problem with what I'm doing, talk to me. Don't talk about me. Talk to me about me. Iron on iron removes the dullness and restores the shine of new metal. That is why every one of us should have spiritual friends. Spiritual friends who have the authority to tell you when you're going wrong. You have to give them the authority. I have to give them the authority. My illustration for today is called The Woodcutter's Secret. Once upon a time, there were two men who were taking part in a wood chopping contest. So they were, the, they were taking part in this wood chopping contest and they had to chop down as many trees in the forest as they could from sunrise to sunset. Now, I know some people will call this treason and uh, will say that, you know, the, 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 the people from Greenpeace would not like this, but this is just an illustration. No trees were hurt during the filming of this video. They had to chop down as many trees in the forest as they, as they could from sunrise to sunset. The winner would be rewarded with both fame and fortune. He would be famous as the, the best woodcutter and he would earn a lot of money as a prize and then he would always have work. Now both men got to work and they steadily chopped and chopped. Their muscles were glistening as they swung those, those axes and they chopped the trees and the trees began to fall and one after the other the trees were falling down by noon these both were neck and neck but then all of a sudden one man stopped and he took a long break the other man saw this and thought to himself a lazy fool he's probably tired now he's taking a break for lunch i'll carry on this gives me a chance to get ahead of him and win this contest so i won't stop i'll just keep chopping and he carried on a while later, the, the man who took a break got back to work. By late afternoon, however, the man who had taken his lunch break had chopped down more trees than the hardworking competitor. So there you have it. This man who sat down and had his lunch and came back after about an hour, he, he was chopping more trees than the man who didn't take a break. And the man who didn't take a break was quite hungry now. He was tired. His arms ached. And by the time the sun set, the man who had taken a break at, at midday had chopped almost twice as many trees as the other man who was drenched in sweat. He was hungry, exhausted. He was battling to swing his axe. And so the prize went to the man who took a break and he won. Now the loser looked very puzzled. He was very upset. And he went to this man and he said, how did you beat me? You were lazy. 
You even took a break for lunch. Yes, said the winner. I did take a break for lunch. But during my lunch break, I sharpened my axe. The loser thought to himself, he sharpened his axe? I was too busy cutting down trees to sharpen my axe. You see, well, what is the woodcutter's secret? What is the witness's secret? Don't wait until you, your ministry loses effectiveness. Keep your axe sharp. Keep yourself sharp. No, have your knowledge ready. Know the word of God because you can forget the word of God. Some of the memory verses I learned when I was a kid, I can't recall fully right now. When I was in, in Sunday school, we had to learn a whole chapter for memory verse. I can't remember those chapters like I used to. Keep yourself sharp. That is the woodcutter's secret. In closing, I want to tell you that an axe, an axe is not a hammer. Growing up on a farm, my siblings and I, and this is a true story, my siblings and I are no strangers to axes and chopping down trees. The first lesson we learned about wielding an axe to chop a tree was firstly to figure out where the tree would fall. That is what we were taught by my parents and my eldest brother. Figure out where the tree is going to fall before you start chopping. The second lesson was to make sure the axe was sharp. This we learned sometimes through trial and error. But we learned the second lesson was keep the axe sharp. A dull axe is as good as a hammer. If your, if your axe doesn't have a good sharp edge, it is as good as a hammer. Try chopping down a tree with a hammer. You will be yet till kingdom come, you will still be chopping. A sharp axe makes the job easier and safer. In other words, I'm saying to you, preparedness for ministry. Having a sound knowledge of the word of God and the practices of God and the doctrines of God is 80% of the battle won. With an axe, sorry, with use, with usage, an axe loses its sharpness and it must be sharpened again. The world is changing. The questions are changing. You need to be able to understand them. You need to learn the new questions that people are asking and how to answer them. Now, anyone who you has used an axe knows that it is better to sharpen your axe for a few minutes after each use than wait for it to become dull. Because if you sharpen your axe after use, then next time you have a use for it and it's an emergency, you don't have to waste time sharpening it. You can just go and chop the tree. And if you wait for it to become dull, then you are going to spend hours and hours sharpening that axe. This way, method of sharpening, regular sharpening, is always, sorry, sorry, makes sure or ensures that your axe is always sharp and ready for use. Don't wait until your ministry loses its edge to sharpen upon the word of God. Like the axe of the apostles, excuse the pun, sharpen your axe every day. I trust you have enjoyed this word of God and that it has been a blessing to you. If you're inspired by it, please share it with your friends and family. Share the audio, share the video. Remember our messages can be found on our YouTube channel, Riverside Tabernacle. Please note it is, there are two Riverside Tabernacles. Ours is the one with the gold dove logo, that logo that's on the back. Look for that logo. For prayer and counseling, you can call or message me on plus two seven seven four three eight one fifty fifty nine. That's in South African code plus two seven seven four three eight one fifty fifty nine. Remember, we live on Facebook every Wednesday at seven p.m. and Sundays at ten a.m. This is Pastor Simon, and as always, it has been my pleasure. Till next time, God bless.